Uh, today we're in uh, Boise, Idaho, on behalf of the J. Bay Jacobs Library for the History of Obstetrics and Gynecology in America that's located at the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Uh, we're going to visit today with Dr. John I. Brewer, a Professor Emeritus of Northwestern University Medical School and the ninth president of the ACOG. It's indeed a, a special pleasure and privilege for me to uh, visit with you, Dr. Brewer, you being a former chairman, professor, and mentor. And uh, why don't we just begin at the beginning? Uh, where were you born? And tell us a little bit about your schooling. Yeah, I was born in Milford, Illinois, in October 9, 1903. A few days uh, ago. A few days ago. And uh, schooling, I went to Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois, for three years, and then went to University of Chicago uh, and completed. They registered me in the fourth year of college and medical school at the same time. So I took double duty courses and finished uh, the S degree in 1925. At the same time, I finished my first year in medical school. And then that time, medical, uh, uh, medical at university had no clinical facilities at all. And when we registered, we were told that we could go to Rush Medical School, which had no first two-year medical school, but had a two-year clinical f facility in Chicago. So it was a combined uh, MD, really, from Rush and the University of Chicago. And the degree is signed by both, yeah. Both. And then you got a PhD in anatomy. That was at the University of Chicago yes. in 1936. Now, you mentioned uh, going to Bradley College. Uh, you didn't say anything about your athletic prowess at that time. I didn't. No, <laughs> no. Well, I played uh, football, basketball, and baseball. And uh, it was a unique experience. Uh, football, I was a uh, second-string quarterback. The first-string quarterback was the passer and the kicker. And so he had, you didn't have double duty. Res, uh, assistants come in and change positions. I got a letter the other day from Jim Breen, uh, one of the past presidents of the college also, and it had a little write-up about you in that letter. And it said something that uh, you were still uh, not playing golf, but getting out on the golf course with your friends and doing a little teaching yet. So <laughs> still teaching some golf. Yeah, I've got one, one student who wanted to learn to play golf at the age of 60. So I'm doing that once a week. Uh -huh. Now, a after you uh, graduated, uh, you went into practice at St. Luke's Hospital? Right. And was that with H.O. Jones at the right. time? Right. And you stayed in practice with him until he retired. Yeah, that was a teaching hospital of Northwestern University Medical School. Now, St. Luke's Hospital was uh, uh, very famous, I think, for vaginal surgery, as was Chicago. And now, having uh, been in the operating with you many, many times, uh, I know that you were a superb vaginal surgeon. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, Developing that pull-through technique and your techniques? Well, first I should say that in medical school, in the clinical years at Rush, uh, I took OP gynae course. And they had a fellow chap, Dr. Sprout Haney, who was making a lifetime experiment of vaginal hysterectomies because at that time there weren't many done in, in the United States. And he was trying to determine how much could be done. 
and I watched that for two years. And this was superb, he is a superb man. Well, so were you at that surgery. And we all came in the operating room to learn how to do it, and they used to come from all over the country. And I recall you're going all over the country to uh, show them how to do it, even at Harvard uh, one day. They got me in trouble at Harvard. <laughs> yes. Uh, you moved over to Passivan Hospital, part of Northwestern, in 1947. And uh, in about 1952, you recruited uh, Ralph Rees and, and DaCosta and myself to come to Passivant when you were the head of obstetrics and gynecology and head of gynecology for Northwestern at that time. And that was about the time of the beginning of the American Academy of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And uh, Ralph Rees, uh, being your, one of your closest friends, yeah. Uh, you and he must have talked about the beginning of the Academy. Could you give us a few words about that? Oh, yes. Uh, we seldom disagreed on points. It's a remarkable thing. And when I recruited Ralph, I did it uh, casually. I was driving him home from a meeting, and I said, Would you like to come to Northwestern? I'd like to have you in the department. Oh, I accept when. And I said, when do you want to come? Anytime, you name it. And he said, well, I want to bring DeCosta and Gerby with me. I said, I accept them. I said, how old is Gerby and how old is DeCosta? He told me. And so I said, yes, we, we will take you. And I have to add here that you may recall that I gave you every stinking job there was to do when you got there. Yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. And we tried to do them, too. <laughs> you uh, did. Yeah. Beautifully. You know, you were uh, the chairman of the Corioepithelioma Registry yeah. and the uh, director of the John I. Brewer Trophoblastic Disease Center at Northwestern. Uh, how did you get interested in uh, trophoblastic disease? Well, I worked in, did experimental work in human embryology. And in the 1930s, uh, discovered it came across and described very early human embryos. And then the choriocarcinoma, one of the trophoblastic diseases, was a very serious cancer, 80% uh, mortality and that sort of thing. And nothing had been done anywhere that had done any good, there wasn't any real claim to anything. And then the uh, word came out from National Cancer Institute that they had seen a patient who had two cancers, a lady patient who had two cancers, and one of them was choreo, and they didn't know how to treat that, but they knew how to treat the other one, so they started chemotherapy, and the patient got well. And I heard it heard about it direct from there when I was told that they had six patients cured. So I got a plane and flew down to Bethesda to the National Cancer Institute. They uh, were delighted to greet me and talk to me and then they I wanted to know if I'd like to see some of their slides, and I said, yes, very much so. So they uh, showed me slides and started to tell about the patient. And I asked them if they would not do that, but let me look at the slides and tell them what I see and what I think about the situation because that's more fun for me. So they started and showed me then all the way through six patients. 
An example of one patient with the cervix is the tissue of the biopsy. And in it was choriocarcinoma cells. And those cells, however, were degenerating. Some of them completely degenerated. So the fellow said, well, what do you think about it, Matt? He said, well, this is a patient that had choreo of the uterus with metastasis to the cervix. And she's had her treatment, and the treatment's been successful. But we had fun. Die. That, by the way, is how you used to teach the medical students at Northwestern. Yeah, including um, you. On pathology, yes. Yeah. You'd give them a slide and say, give me the patient's history and tell me all about her. Uh, you were the uh, district chairman of the college, District 6 chairman. Uh, I guess it was the academy at the time. Yes. And uh, as district chairman, uh, you invited the residents to come to one of the meetings. And from that grew the junior fellows of the ACOG. That's correct, yes. Do you remember uh, uh, that meeting? I think we had a meeting in uh, Des Moines. Yeah. And uh, the residents all came and put on a program. And that now has become uh, one of the biggest, uh, like major part of the college are the junior fellows. Yes, and when I presented that to the academy board, because it was an academy at that time, when I uh, presented to the board, they voted me down, the vote being six to one, about having junior participation. So I told them I was going to go home starting one in my district, and they weren't going to stop me. That was the start of it, yeah. That was the start of it. Now all the districts have it. They have a major. They meet uh, in Washington, uh, I think, a couple times a year, and uh, doing a, a great job. That took four years to accomplish, so. That took four years. Yes, sir. And, and uh, another thing I remember is at one of our district meetings in Chicago, you invited the nurses that were interested in gynecology and obstetrics around uh, District 6 mm -hmm. to come to a meeting. Right. I think Dr. Kamenetsky and I and uh, Ben Peckham, uh, Clay Burchell, you appointed all of us to work on that committee. And from that grew the Nurses Association in Obstetrics and Gynecology. Right. I assume they gave you uh, a lot of flack about that also. They did. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, and uh, now that has grown into a big society and is now an independent group. Uh, the beginning of the Green Journal, that's an mm. other journal, as you call it, yeah. Obstetrics and Gynecology, uh, began also at Passivan Hospital with Dr. Reese. And I know you helped him uh, put that together. Uh, was there much uh, of a problem at that time? Well, there were problems of all kinds, of course. Putting a new journal, getting a new journal on his feet. But he did a superb job, and he's done a superb job. And uh, a few years later, you became the, uh, well, you were an editor of the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and then uh, a few years later, you became editor-in-chief of the American Journal, which is uh, the journal for all the major organizations except for the American College. And I... You're still the editor emeritus of that, is mm. that right? After 31 years' service, 31. yes. And how's that going? Excellent. Superior. Mm -hmm. Dr. Z, as you call him, Dr. Zuspin. Yes. And uh, Dr. Quilligan. Dr. Q, Dr. Quilligan. And their crew, yes. And they're still working on that? Yes, very much so. And I understand that uh, you had them here in August visiting you? Yes, they came to visit. I took them out to see some golf courses, they wanted to see golf courses. Did they do any editing work at the time? Oh, yeah. Oh. Yes, we did work. Okay, now, Dr. Brewer, you have been what I call uh, the winner of the Grand Slam in obstetrics and gynecology. You were president of the American Gynecologic Society, the American Association of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, 
and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. That's our three major organizations. Uh, now the American Gynae and the uh, American Association are the American, is the American Gynae and Obstetric Society. But being president of all three of these societies, you've had quite an impact uh, on our specialty. You know, what do you think was the greatest impact? <laughs> oh, that would be hard to tell. Uh, it gave me the opportunity to do things that uh, I thought ought to be done, and many of those things have become standard procedures. Uh, that, uh, and in the changing uh, uh, of organizations and development of the American uh, American College of OB Ghani. And speaking of uh, the development of the American College, uh, you were also president of the Central Association of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Yeah. And in uh, October of 1952, you gave your presidential address. The American Academy of Obstetrics and Gynecology had really just formed a year or so before. No, no, no. And in your yeah, the, what? the American Academy had yes. just formed, yes. and in your presidential address, uh, you said that the immediate and initial objectives of the academy have been accomplished, uh, namely to organize a society, to incorporate it, to acquire members, to have an annual meeting, and to, to promote publications and contributions. And you went on to say the objectives of the American Academy of Obstetricians and Gynecology can be attained best if the new organization is on the same level as the American College of Surgeons and the American College of Physicians. The objectives of these three organizations are similar. The American College of Surgeons and of Physicians since 1913 and 15 respectively have established for themselves the highest place in the field of surgery and medicine. An American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists must stand side by side with the American College of Surgeons, the American College of Physicians, in their efforts to improve medical care in this country. Uh, so with your presidential address, uh, you proposed the formation of the College of obstetricians and gynecologists. Uh, from the academy. From the academy. Uh, since uh, what has happened to the college from those days, did you visualize the, <laughs> the growth that it had? No way. No way. No way. There were just a few thousand members at the time, and now there are some 34,000 uh, mm -hmm. fellows and junior fellows in the college, and now they're having a educational members and associate members. Yeah, because at the time that was done, even medical schools, only five medical schools, had a department of ob -Gyne. I see. And so from that... They, from didn't, they did it and took them years after that to develop departments of ob -Gyne. Uh, I have here, and I hope it shows on the videotape, the uh, picture of you with the executive board of the college uh, when you became the president of the mm -hmm. college uh, at that time. And uh, here is, uh, I believe this is you uh, receiving the certificate of the president of the American College. Yeah, from, you Glenn, also, from Glenn Craig, as I remember. Yes, it is. And you also uh, received the Distinguished Service Award from the college and, of course, uh, many, many other awards. When you were president, uh, when you uh, the Central, though, it, your paper was entitled, uh, uh, I believe, From Little Acorns, yeah. uh, meaning that from a, a small beginning, uh, we have a huge uh, oak tree and, of course, the huge college that developed from the time uh, that you made that talk. But after you presented it and proposed the college, uh, you had a meeting, uh, they, they made a committee, formed a committee called the Little Acorns Committee. 
And uh, you, with the committee, met with the American College of Surgeons. Now, you were also a, a board member of the Board of Regents of the College of Surgeons, and I believe vice president. And you, uh, with that committee, met with the College of Surgeons with another old friend of yours, uh, Dr. Loyal Davis. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us about the College's of Surgeons' reaction to the College of yeah. Surgeons? Well, they knew about it earlier than that because before I even said a word about it, if anything, any kind, I talked to the top people in the College of Surgeons because I wanted to explain why I wanted the academy to be a college, why I wanted them to do what exactly what the College of Surgeons was doing. And that in doing that, I let them know this was not a fight about the College of Surgeons or dissatisfaction with the College of Surgeons because it wasn't. I was a College of Surgeons man and, and been a region of the College of Surgeons and so forth and so on. And so uh, they understood that. And in meetings later, you talk about there was no serious discord of any, there was no angerness of any kind. Well, that was kind of a surprise, wasn't it? Yes, it, it was. Because you thought that this was going to be in competition because the College of Surgeons was founded by a gynecologist, also from your hospital, Franklin Martin from, oh, yes. from Passavent. I know. And, uh, uh, what about uh, your uh, a meeting with Dr. Davis about the journal. Was there any problem since he was editor of Surgery, Gynecology, and Obstetrics, and you were editor of the American Journal? No, many incumbents or arguments that fell out over anything I've had to do. We have been see very, very clearly things about the same way. He was a man who got a lot of things said about him that weren't correct. Well, I, I've said many times, because I worked with him also on your appointment, and then said, uh, he, I never, I've seen him mad many times, but I never saw him wrong uh, yeah. when he was uh, upset. Uh, the uh, paper you then wrote when you were the president, you gave your presidential address uh, to the American College of Obstetricians, and the title was Good Fences Make Good Neighbors. And uh, that is really uh, contemporary today, some 35 years later. Uh, do the... Well, it's still true. Still true. Yes. Uh, you were talking about cooperating with the other specialties. Right. And uh, uh, the meeting with Department of Medicine, Department of Surgery, and radiology, particularly at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, uh, as you know, the big uh, movement is for obstetrics and gynecology as a primary care specialty. So we certainly need to cooperate with medicine and pediatrics family practice. Yeah, well, your experience on the American board should clarify that readily in your mind, how it works and why it works, and how it's got to work. Yes, well, you were also director of the American Board, and I believe vice president of the American Board, and on their examination committee, and uh, helped develop the examination, so it did have uh, the integrated questions from these other specialties. We did have fun with the slides for pathology, didn't we? I'm sorry <laughs> to say the... Uh, Glass slides are gone, but the photomicrographs uh, remain yeah. on that. Uh, would, do you have any other comments you'd like to make on the, uh, either the beginnings of the college or as it's been growing? Well, let me think just a moment. Uh, okay. I think the college first needed to be a college rather than an academy. That its purpose couldn't be accomplished with a title such as academy versus American College of Surgeons, Medicine, or the AMA, or such organizations. 
And in developing the college, the college has done, I think, everything they have done since they started, the moves they've made, and changes they've made, have been good. And they have done a superb job in keeping their members current with all their courses and so forth, say, offer or have, and that sort of thing. And the library has been established there, and that's been a good deal because uh, somebody is keeping look over some things that work and need keeping track of. I think they've done a superb job. And uh, as you know, they uh, have a new building, the Warren Pierce Building yes. in Washington. And uh, they have many functions, the uh, practice committee, the education committee, the government relations, and all their publications. Uh, and uh, particularly the patient information bulletins that uh, they mm -hmm. publish for, uh, to give out to all the patients. Right. Uh, did you have uh, a beginning with the technical bulletins? Did you work with them, with the uh, patient information? Information? Oh, here and there, not with any great stride or great effort, no. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'm pulling up some of your old friends. Uh, the very first uh, medical director of the college was Dr. Uh, Kimbrough from mm -hmm. Philadelphia. Uh, he, be, he came, and then uh, I think Dr. Newton, Michael Newton, was the next. And of course, uh, now Dr. Dr. Pierce, and now Dr. Hale. Uh, this function in the college uh, was, came later in the uh, college, and what did you think about that? About Kimbrough? About Kimbrough. Uh, well, the reason he came to Chicago and took the job is he and I had been, he lived in Philadelphia, and I live in Chicago, but we had met at medical meetings continually over the years. We liked golf, we liked everything we liked, we liked the same. We became very close friends. And I'm the fellow that got him the job as head of the college because he had the experience, training, and personality that the head of the college ought to, be, ought to have. He got along well with people. He knew how to handle them. Was he as good a dancer as you and Ruth were? No. No. <laughs> no. no. Um, one of the things, another person was uh, Donald Richardson. Yes. who came as an executive uh, right. for the college uh, he early. Was, he was a superb man in those early days. He was really superb. Uh, I think his brother uh, was the uh, executive for the Central yeah. and recommended Don to you and to Dr. Reese right. and uh, Dr. Schmitz. Uh, yeah. And then so he was the first uh, really executive director of the college. And... Uh, of the academy, which then became the college yeah. and helped to build it. And then, of course, uh, the others that followed and Warren Pierce uh, really uh, it just exploded and multiplied under him. And now it's running very well under Ralph Hale's Good. tutelage. Good. Uh, one of the, I think, your greatest honor was to have a professorial chair called the John and Ruth Brewer uh, Professorship in Gynecology and Cancer Research at Northwestern. That was established in 1983. Right. Uh, Dr. Lorraine is the holder of that. Right. And he worked with you with choriocarcinoma. Yes. And how is that uh, working? Excellent. He's a very good man, hard worker. Intelligent and capable, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, your wife, Ruth, was an important part of all of our lives, your life particularly, but all of us at Northwestern and at the college. 
Uh, she was very active. Well, you know, the dean had done that with two chairs where he thought the wife needed some credit. And one was Loyal Davis, and he asked him, would that be all right? Yes, that'd be fine. And then he asked me if that would be all right, and I said, certainly. We're the only two in the university that have a wife who is not a medical person listed as a co-holder of the chair. I think it's ideal. Well, she was very much involved at the university, as was Edith Davis. And uh, as I said, the two of you were great friends. Uh, but Mrs. Brewer was also very much involved in the college meetings. I know she was uh, the ladies' chairman, uh, oh, at least a couple of occasions, uh, worked with the college to make the uh, annual clinical meeting uh, what it is today. Uh, she was a big worker. Yes and uh, did that. Uh, one of the things we want to know is if you have some advice for, for some of us for the future of what's happening. No, <clears throat> basically not. The advice is hard to give, and you don't need any. Well, the, the college, you know, would... Uh, is always uh, looking at its past presidents to uh, see if they think they were going in the right direction. Uh, the primary care, uh, oh, particular. Yes, one can give opinions that, but one isn't certain how that will work out yet. Uh -huh. And also uh, in the modern age of managed care. Uh, Fortunately, I think we missed that, but do you have any comments on that? No, and not being in the practice of it, I don't know much about it. Because mm -hmm. I don't have to compete with it or understand it. Okay. It has some good things, but some things I don't like about it. Well, we are about the end of our interview, and... Uh, I just want to thank you again uh, because there's no one in the country today that has your perspective of either the foundation of the founding of the academy and then the college or the growth of the college. Uh, you've been uh, there through all of it uh, from the beginning of the academy uh, to the literally proposing the formation of the college to running the college as its president, the district chairman. Uh, and so uh, we are especially pleased that we could be here today. Well, I'm glad to be here. And I'd like to say something, too. You know, Dr. Gerby just recently was awarded a professorship and a chair for which we all congratulate him, and he was just had the congratulating party. Yeah, but this is your 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 day to day, not mine. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's all right. But I do thank you, and I thank you for all your help over the years. Because without you, that chair would never have come to be. Uh, I want to also thank uh, Dr. Warren Pierce and David Barton of uh, Boise, Idaho who uh, helped to organize this session today and the Boise State University for the use of their uh, marvelous facilities. Yeah. So we thank you very much, Dr. Thank Brewer. you.